uh, discovery, I guess. So this is actually your physical evidence. Mm -hmm. Discovery encompasses everything, like the all the reports, the narratives, the supplements. Uh, oh, okay. And then this this is your physical evidence. And what people don't understand about physical evidence, here's an, another little lesson from me, Sam, your favorite private investigator. FDLE will only test five items at a time. So it, even if you've got 200, they're only testing five. Um, and it doesn't come back immediately. And there is no quirky girl in a lab somewhere. You hand her the item and like in 20 minutes, she's figured out what it is. It goes off for testing, uh, depending on if it's biological, if it's ballistic, um, or latent. And so the detectives will choose what they want to try and test. They'll send it to the FDLE and wait for the results. And nine times out of ten, they come back with nothing. And yeah, there are three Publix receipts. Okay. But only two wine bottles from the trash. Everybody keeps saying they think he used the, the baseball bat or that she did. I don't think she did. I think it was just there. And they picked it up. I agree. I no, think I, he got, I think injuries came from coming down the stairs. Some people in your chat had speculated that they thought he beat, she beat him with the bat. I disagree. I don't think he's got the right injuries for that. And I also don't think that's how she is. I was on mute. I was trying to answer your question. The Publix receipts somewhere in here, it says they're, they're wine receipts somewhere else in this document. That's why it said that. Um, yeah, the white cap, I think he was wearing that. Okay, that would make sense. The necktie but might have been for the donation. It was inside the suitcase. Like, but I yeah, there this, wasn't a whole lot. No, this case is... This trial could literally take two days. Three. You could take a day to select a jury. You could take a day to put the state on. Half a day to put on a defense. And half a day in closing, you'd be done. I don't see how this trial gets to two weeks in length. I really oh, don't. Come on. Don't you want to see James Owen do his thing in court, girl? <sighs> I mean, I feel like we're going to get a show because clearly he wants a show. Um, <laughs> but it'll be interesting to see how long they manage to, to drag it out. But in reality... Murder trials are not usually very complex and they don't last very long. So here's what they're telling me that they've taken out. They've taken out any kind of emergency communications, social security information, security system plans, emergency response plans, DNA, substance of a confession. And this is the report that was done by Chelsea I, I thought that was interesting. Her last, they've got her last name is Connolly here. Hmm. Oh, this is her CRA. Or mm -hmm. her narrative, sorry. Her narrative, it's, yeah. It's, it's not narrative. necessarily what, what, this isn't going to be what's on that police report. I don't think that we saw, is it? Um. Sometimes they, so like when I, when I, like. when I get a report from, uh, like one of my local sheriff's offices, it's actually, it's an amazing piece of work because it's got a table of contents <laughs> and it's a oh. thousand pages long. And so the lead detective will, will write the first, their first narrative. And then they, they come back with supplemental narratives and each person who works on the case who had anything to do with it, even if it was just securing the crime scene, they each have an entry for, for their narrative so our, our this, police reports that i get are just are just gin, ginormous so while you were talking i just looked this is the same police report that they do have on the docket um but there's so, more here there's um so <clears throat> her writing like that there's your okay so there's your crime scene log mm -hmm. this is her arrest affidavit so this is what they used I, I'm assuming for um, probably. Uh, remember how I told you I couldn't remember who Shanice Robinson was? Oh, wait. This is 65 pages long. Yeah. 
Okay, so this is the police report then. Uh, Shanice, this is like all of the comp compiled reports, mm -hmm. which I need to go through and pick out what I want to talk about because I think it'll be interesting what the different, what they all picked up on, you know? Sure. This is what I do uh, for my job. Is oh, is it? I get police reports, like I said, sometimes upwards of a thousand pages. And I go through it page by page by page. Somewhere I'm looking at my little notes here. Somewhere I thought I had started a list of who I believed was going to be called or who was on the the, the list of witnesses to be called. And this mm -hmm. Shanice Robinson is one of them. And obviously she's a forensics with the um, sheriff's office, I would assume. Fire department. My bad. She's fire department. FD 28. So she and would then, just be fire rescue. Yeah. And when they got there, they couldn't do anything. So these are all fire. Judith was a fire rescue. Shanice Robinson was forensics. But so, it says, but it says, does it not say FD 28? Hmm. I don't know. I'm just going to put down on my notes. She's forensics. So when I've, I've answered my questions about who Devin Jamro and for the, getting this stuff has answered those questions for me. Is it possible that's her badge number? Maybe that's what it is. That's a good point. Um, a lot of, off well, all the officers have some kind of a number associated with them. I'm not saying that's what it is. I honestly don't know. So, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I did that, right? Yes. Um, God, she drives me crazy. Death investigation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see. I just need to go through these different ones. So, so we won't go through this now. You're just but. looking. You're just looking at. Uh, this is just standard paperwork, right? That. Uh, here's a consent to search. So she signed off that she can search. Consent. I can speak that she consented to search the house. So nope. they didn't have to. Nope. So see, nope. This is just for the phone. Okay. I'm sorry. I can't read it. I know. Because I looked at that too. I was like, is this for the house and the phone? Well, it's, it's just waiver. the phone. Okay. So waiver and affidavit. So this is where um, they don't have to go get a warrant. If she agrees that's consent to search then and so they don't have so, to warrant for them which i think answers a lot of people's questions because there was like are they going to get those videos thrown out no 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 they're not going to get the the main videos of him in the suitcase they will not get thrown out there's no way not with this mm -hmm. um there's her signature right there you guys she did it on the 24th of february while they were on scene okay I and, and i've got a, a little video with you one time and show uh your subscribers what a cellbrite extraction looks like oh yeah that'd be fun they're monstrous <laughs> but but i can find a small one and, and just and show you what it is that we're looking at when we get something like that we've seen like we've seen some stuff thrown at different trials and whatnot that'll be thrown up on the screen you know and i'm sure we've seen like bits and pieces of it because i know the case with um Oh, the Oxford Shooter's parents, Jennifer Crumbly. They were pulling a lot of stuff from her phone. Um, I don't know if it's the same kind of look, though. It'd be interesting to find out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sam, again, for all of your time and your help. And just, you know, thanks for being a friend. Oh, thank you. I enjoy myself doing this. This is fun. Well, it's just so nice to have somebody to talk to. Absolutely. And I don't have to go to the jail to find somebody to talk to. Yeah, I'd prefer you not go to the jail and find people to talk to. <laughs> you and me we'd, both. We'd, we'd prefer you not do that. Especially I'm always down to talk about it because I never get the chance to talk about it with anybody. So Yeah, definitely on like when we're doing like a trial or something, you need somebody. Oh, it's just such so long. You need another yeah, person in there. I agree. And I like being able to to show a perspective that not everybody gets to see. Like, 
like I said, I didn't even know my job existed until I found it. <laughs> well, that's true. All right. Well, I will see you very soon then. Okay. Okay. Don't go anywhere, everyone. Sam was leaving, and I'm picking back up the next day to go over some of these items in the police report. So let's look at this arrest affidavit. I don't honestly think I've ever done this on my channel um, for this case. And I usually, this is like one of the first things I do. So this was presented or pr this was put together by Chelsea. It's funny how it says her, her last, this must have been before she was married. I don't know. I'm going to start reading this if it seems to be where it's just too much of what we already know and we don't need all this, then I'll change it up, okay? On February 24th of 2020 at 1301 hours, Orange County deputies responded to 4748 France Lane, number three, Winter Park, Florida, in reference to a female reporting that her boyfriend, George Torres Jr., was deceased. The caller, later identified as Sarah Boone, reported playing a game of hide and seek. Sarah and George jokingly thought it would be it would be funny if George got in the suitcase located in the living room. Sarah zipped George in the suitcase. Sarah mentioned that she and George had been consuming alcohol during the night and she went upstairs and passed out in her bed. She later woke up to her cell phone ringing multiple times around 1100 hours. She went downstairs and did not see George anywhere in the apartment. Now that's the following day, you guys. She then realized that he was possibly still inside the suitcase. Sarah unzipped the suitcase and found George unresponsive and not breathing. Shortly after 9-11, shortly after the 9-1 call, deputies arrived on scene. Orange County Fire Department confirmed that George was in fact deceased at 1307 hours. The decedent was found lying near the front door of the resident near a blue suitcase. A small laceration was evident on the decedent's lip and what appeared to be some bruising around his eye. Okay, and then she says this is the interview with Sarah Boone. On February 24th of 2020 at 1657 hours, Detective Scott Lowen and I conducted an audio recorded interview with Sarah Boone located in my unmarked agency vehicle outside of her residence located at 4748 France Lane number three, Winter Park, Florida. The following is a synopsis of Sarah Boone's sworn recorded statement. I read verbatim to Sarah her constitutional Miranda warnings. Sarah agreed she understood what I had just read to her. On February 23rd, 2020, at approximately 1600 hours, Sarah was located at her residence, 4748 France Lane, number three, Winter Park, Florida, along with her boyfriend, George Torres Jr., who also, resided, who also resides at the apartment. Only Sarah and George were located at the residence. Sarah's son would sometimes be at her residence when it was her days per the custody agreement with her ex-husband. Sarah said her, her and George were painting pictures and completing a puzzle while sharing a bottle of Woodbridge Chardonnay wine. As the evening went on, Sarah said her and George decided to play a game called hide and seek. Sarah hid upstairs in her shower first and said George never came to look for her. After a while, she decided to go downstairs where she found George. Sarah and George both thought it would be funny if she zipped George in the blue suitcase that was located downstairs in the living room area that had a few miscellaneous items they had both planned to, do to donate. George willingly got into the suitcase and Sarah zipped the suitcase up. But two of George's fingers were able to stick out of the suitcase. Remember, this is what Sarah told them. Sarah and George were both laughing that she zipped him into the suitcase. Sarah explained the attached handle that made it easier to zip the suitcase was broken, but a paper clip was in the zipper, and she was able to zip the suitcase up. On February 24th of 2020, at approximately 30 hours, 12.30 a.m., Sarah decided she was going to go upstairs while George was still located in the suitcase, thinking he could get himself out. Sarah laid down on her bed and fell asleep approximately 20 to 30 minutes after going upstairs. Sarah assumed George was going to get out of the suitcase and come to bed as well. Sarah said neither her nor George were drunk from the wine. Sarah woke up in the morning and heard her cell phone ringing multiple times but ignored the calls. Sarah said her cell phone was left downstairs from the night prior. That's very interesting. She didn't take her cell phone upstairs. We've got a documentation that she called Brian around 1146 p.m. And so if she, her cell phone was downstairs, then we know that she was down there till at least 1145. We know she took the suitcase photos or videos between 1112, 1123. So she sat downstairs for a good 20, 20 minutes at minimum before calling Brian, which makes me think he died right then and there. That's what I think. I think he died right there. And that's why she called Brian because she was freaking out. 
Okay, where did I leave off? Sarah knew her ex-husband, Brian Boone, was calling because he was the only person who called her repeatedly to see if she was getting her their son from school. That's kind of telling, you know. She kind of tells on herself there, and she doesn't even realize it. Sarah said she stayed upstairs for a while and assumed George was downstairs on his laptop looking for employment. Sarah said she went downstairs at approximately 1,100 hours and realized that she could not find George anywhere in the apartment. Sarah freaked out and remembered the last time she saw George was when she zipped him in the suitcase. Sarah unzipped the suitcase and found George unresponsive. Sarah called Brian back, told him George was dead, and begged him to come to her residence. Brian only resides a few minutes away. When Brian got to the residence, he walked into the apartment, saw George unresponsive on the floor. I don't know what they what's unredacted right there. Brian then immediately walked outside and stayed there until law enforcement arrived. Again, a little bit is redacted there. Okay, now we're going to talk about her cell phone. On February 24th of 2020, Sarah gave verbal and written consent by signing a waiver and affidavit form for the cell phone for the Orange County Sheriff's Office to search her iPhone XF. And if you guys will remember, I did show you guys that form in a previous video. Digital Forensic Investigation, Janella Udana, wait, Uadan, Uadan, responded to the scene and began to download the cell phone. While the cell phone was being downloaded, two videos were found on the cell phone. The first video began recording on February 24th of 2020 at 2312 hours, 1112 p.m. George repeatedly yelling out Sarah's name. Sarah told George, for everything you've done to me, fuck you. Sarah was laughing when she said, fuck you. Stupid. George repeatedly kept calling out Sarah's name. George said, I can't fucking breathe. Seriously. Sarah said, yeah, that's what you do when you choke me. George continued to repeat himself and telling Sarah he could not breathe. Sarah replied, that's on you. Oh, that's what I feel like when you cheat on me, Sarah said. You should probably shut the fuck up. In the video, the suitcase was facing downward, and you can see George pushing on the suitcase in an attempt to get out. The video is two minutes and three seconds long. The second video began recording on February 24th of 2020. George yelled out Sarah's name. The suitcase was now in a different position, facing upwards, and moved over towards the left side of the living room. The video was 22 seconds long. Synopsis of George Torres Jr.'s autopsy on February 25th of 2020. All right, I'm going to bring up something here to show you guys while we're doing this. So I did this little diagram. And I'm going to tell you, there's something off about my little diagram. <laughs> I moved the page, and when I moved the page, it took one of my, my features off. So let me find it. Now I'm going to show it to you before we get started. This is in my gallery. I already posted this over in our members only thing. Let me look over here. All right. Now, here's what I want to show you guys is messed up. This right here should be like right here around his little bone, whatever that bone is right there on brother's shoulder. But as you're looking at these injuries, I want you to think about the fact that these areas that are bruised were exposed in the suitcase. Let me show you this image real quick. As you're looking at the injuries, I want you guys to look at the way this person is, isn't laying down here. This is probably the closest image I could find to I, what I think or I believe was where George was or how George was in the suitcase for him to fit in the suitcase. And as you'll see, if the suitcase is probably tighter around his legs and, and thighs and hips than anywhere else, right? So he may not have been able to get his hand down past his legs to go by his feet if the zipper was down in that area. And I'd mentioned that before in another video. So unless the unzipped portion was up by his head, it would have been Im almost impossible. It, well, it would have been impossible for him to figure out that he could unzip it. But as you see, his as his back is like curved there, I want you to look at the curvature of his body. Only thing I didn't see was anything around his buttocks area that I saw. I just think of this image when I'm thinking of him in the suitcase and then let's say the suitcase possibly, I don't know, uh, going down the stairs, maybe. Okay, now let's go back to these other images. Back to these injuries. The red marks right here that are lines are scratch marks from Sarah's nails. 
Synopsis of George Torres Jr.'s Autopsy On February 25th of 2020, George Torres Jr. received an autopsy located at the medical examiner's office. During the autopsy, it was noted that George had injuries. George had long nail scratches to his mid-upper back, a large nail scratch to the back of his neck. Oh, I missed that one, didn't I? I don't think that's on my picture. This is different than the other one I was reading. Contusions to his left shoulder, left skull, and forehead contusions considered blunt force trauma and a cut near his busted lip. So her little preview of what injuries he's had was very brief and exactly that's not what I, not at all what I had. Interesting. Okay, we might save this for another one then. We'll see. All right, let's go back to the report. Follow-up interview with Sarah Boone. Uh, I hope this isn't too, too long because we all watched that through this and watched this so many times. But sometimes reading it or hearing it read, you might pick something up that you didn't pick up before. So I say let's go for it. On February the 25th, the following day of the crime scene being discovered, at approximately 1,500 hours, Sarah drove herself to the Orange County Sheriff's Office located at 2500 West Colonial Drive, Orlando, Florida. Detective Scott Lowen and I conducted an audio and video recorded interview with Sarah. The following is a synopsis of Sarah Boone's sworn recorded statement. I read verbatim to Sarah her constitutional Miranda warnings. Sarah agreed she understood what I had just read to her. After informing Sarah about the injuries to George's body, she continued to deny any physical altercation occurred between the two of them. Sarah was shown the approximate two-minute video that she recorded on her cell phone. Not even halfway through, Sarah no longer wished to watch the video. Sarah said she did not remember making the two videos. Sarah said the video looked bad. Sarah denied intentionally leaving George in the suitcase. Sarah was asked why she intentionally went upstairs and waited for George to come upstairs and did not check on him or let him out prior to going upstairs. Sarah replied, I do not know. Sarah contradicted her original statement and began to blame the consumption of alcohol. Sarah was informed she was not free to leave and under arrest. Deputy Sheriff Lisa De Leon responded to Central Operations to transport Sarah Boone to BRC. Based off Sarah's inconsistent statements on what occurred and the videos found on Sarah's iPhone, I believe probable cause exists to charge Sarah Boone with second-degree murder. George Torres Jr. is dead, and his death was caused by Sarah Boone's criminal act. Sarah zipped George in the suitcase to where he could not get out. George begged Sarah repeatedly, telling him he could not breathe, and Sarah left him there, in the suitcase, therefore proves the unlawful killing of George by Sarah's actions that were imminently dangerous and demonstrated a depraved mind without regard for George's life. A depraved mind. I like that. Now, what we're going to see here is there's all these additional reports because every officer that went on scene had to do a report. So I thought, let's look through these and see what they find. Now, this right here, Sam and I were just talking about, this is where they check in. Whoever was on scene, this is their little check-in thing that they got to do. And you're talking about, in, if it's, we might have already talked about it with Sam, but you're talking about fire department. Anybody that was on scene, they have to sign in on this check, on this form right here so that they can keep up with it on their side. Okay, this is De Leon. This is the one that transported her. So I guess each one of them had to, had to fill out a, this form because there's nothing here yet. But maybe it's down below. Because this name I can't read. The next name I can't read. I can tell by her handwriting. This is Chelsea's. Detective cough a lot. Then there's also going to be one for Lowen too. This is the consent to search her cell phone right here that she signed as they were on scene looking at the, you know, arriving at the crime scene. Nothing else is on there as far as her house or anything else. But she did give them verbal consent to go look at the house because I just watched the video again. Again, here's this form for De Leon. This is routing. Jay Barry. Two discs with audio with recorded interviews. This is evidence forms. I guess they have to fill one of these out every time I do something. Okay, here's where we get into this part. I'm just going to go down the screen here so you guys can see it. This is the mom. They note the mom and dad who they have to inform of the death. 
Okay, here we have De Deputy Sheriff Kayla Rodriguez. She responded to 4748 France Court, Apartment 3, Orlando, Florida, in reference to a man down call. Deputy Sheriff Rodriguez arrived as Orange County Fire Rescue 63 was leaving the apartment and declared George Torres Jr. deceased at 1307 hours. Okay, so this was the female African-American police officer who was on first one on the scene that we watched numerous times, her video. Deputy Sheriff Rodriguez spoke with Sarah Boone, who provided a verbal statement. Deputy Sheriff Rodriguez also met with Brian Boone, who provided a verbal statement. Deputy Rodriguez completed the original incident report, and Rodriguez utilized her body-worn camera. Then we have Deputy Sheriff, a Deputy Sheriff John Martinez. Upon arrival, he established the crime scene and secured it with a scene tape. So this is the one we just watched recently that Sam and I were um, doing commentary on. Deputy Sheriff Martinez maintained the crime scene contamination log. He was near Deputy Rodriguez while she obtained a verbal statement from Sarah Boone and heard what Sarah said and occurred. He completed a supplemental report and he utilized his body-worn camera. Then we have Deputy Sheriff Lisa De Leon. I'm pretty sure that's, sure that's how her, she says her name. Responded to the Orange County Sheriff's Office Central Operations on February 25th of 2020 in reference to transporting Sarah Boone to the Orange County Jail. Deputy Sheriff DeLeon completed a supplemental report and utilized her body-worn camera. <gasps> oh, I want to see that. I want to see that. Sarah riding in the car. You know she was asking all kinds of questions, you guys. This was the blonde detective with the ponytail who took her out of the interrogation room when uh, Scott Lillen was standing there. Oh, that would be so good. Okay. Chelsea Copsell, Detective Coffalot was the lead investigator assigned to the case. Then you have Corporal Detective Nathaniel Taylor, who responded as the homicide scene supervisor. Corporal Taylor authored the exigent search e-warrant from 4848 France Court, Apartment 3. Uh, wrong address that they just typed on there. Then uh, Detective Scott Lowen assisted me with conducting multiple interviews with witnesses and the defendant, Sarah Boone. Then you have crime scene investigator, Melissa Roughgarden, and she is also on the list to testify on in trial. She responded to 4748 France Court, Apartment 3, Orlando, Florida. I should probably stop reading the address at this point, don't you think, you guys? You getting tired of hearing it from me? Investigator Roughgarden responded as the lead crime scene investigator. Crime Scene Investigator Shanice Robinson and Crime Scene Investigator Supervisor Kelly Wood responded and assisted her. Investigator Roughgarden photographed the scene, processed the scene, collected and documented potential evidence, and then she also later completed the original Crime Scene Investigative Report. Medical Legal, uh, is that how you said that? Medical Legal Investigator Ashley Hammermeister. She was there on the 24th to initiate the investigation for the medical examiner's office. She took photos of the scene and supervised the collection of the victim's body for transport from the scene to the medical examiner's office. Then you have Dr. Sarah Zadowix, DO. She's the medical examiner. She's of the District 9 Medical Examiner's Office. She conducted an autopsy on George Torres Jr. She has not determined. Now, remember, this was written... This was when it was ongoing, okay, guys? She had not determined the victim's cause of death at this time and is pending further study. And then, then they get over here to speak with Vincent. And we're going to talk about his testimony really quick. It just says that on February 27th, which was three days later, so that would have been, if Monday was the 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, that would have been Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It would have been Thursday. They came back to interview him. In a sworn audio recorded statement, Detective Scott Lowen spoke with Vincent, also known as Vinny, located outside of his apartment on February 23rd of 2022. So it says that Vincent said that on the 23rd, we've heard this before. We've heard his thing, but I'm just going to read this. It said Vinny was located at his apartment. His apartment wall is shared with Sarah and George's apartment wall. At approximately 23, 15 hours, he heard a loud crashing sound that made the walls shake coming from Sarah and George's apartment. Then we have Brian Boone's testimony and a sworn audio recorded statement done the day after on scene. I spoke with Brian Boone, who stated that on February 24th of 2020, he received a call from his ex-wife, Sarah Boone, who called him panicking that George Torres Jr. was deceased. Brian responded to Sarah's apartment per her request and observed George laying in the living room floor, unresponsive, and told Sarah she needed to call 911.
Brian left Sarah's apartment and waited outside for law enforcement to arrive. Then we have Brandon Motes, who is the roommate of Vinny. In his testimony, also on the 27th, in a sworn audio recorded statement, oh, Chelsea did this one, right? Chelsea did this one. And Brian did the other one probably around the same time, the same day. Brandon was on the night before the night all this happened. Brandon was located at his apartment. His apartment wall is shared with Sarah and George's apartment wall on February the 23rd of 2020 between 22, 30 hours, 10, 30 and 11. Brandon heard a loud crashing sound that made the walls shake coming from Sarah and George's apartment. It's funny how they're not as specific on here, but I guess you don't have to be. You just have to be. That's what the body cam and audio is for, right? Then they spoke to Abraham in a sworn audio recorded statement. I spoke with Abraham Marino, located at Tillwood Park Apartments, front office. Abraham is employed with the apartment complex for maintenance. Abraham spoke about his interactions with Sarah and Sarah Boone and George Torres Jr. from the apartment complex. Then we have Melissa Sexton. Two days afterwards on Wednesday, they spoke with her. They audio taped it. We've heard that one as well. They audio, audio taped it at Tillwood Park Apartments front office. Melissa is the property manager for the apartment complex. Melissa spoke about her interactions with Sarah Boone and George Torres Jr. at the apartment complex. Then finally, we have Juan Torres. Uh, it just says that Juan had a phone conversation with George Torres Jr. During the phone conversation, he heard Sarah Boone in the background acting hostile towards George. Ultimately, George hung up with Juan because of Sarah's behavior. And again, we have audio tape of that as well. I already read that part. Now, this part you may not know. The blue suitcase was measured by crime scene investigators Rough Garden, who provided the following dimensions, 28 inches in length, 28 inches in width, and 8 and 7 8 inch in depth. I want to show you guys something really quickly before we go any further here, because I want to give you a visual of the suitcase. So I myself was trying to figure out, I did a little dive on suitcases to try to figure out, was this a carry-on? What kind of suitcase was this, right? Again, this is in our little members only area of buymeacoffee.com. So I don't know why I thought it might've been a carry-on, like a me. I was thinking medium size, but it looks like it is a larger suitcase. It's probably one of the larger ones you can buy. So this third one right here, 28 inches. Now, of course, this isn't the same style suitcase, but the whole reason I put this picture up was to give you guys a visual of the difference between the carry-ons versus the larger suitcase. And this is probably the closest one I could find in size. Per the Orange County Sheriff's Office mobile com and reporting and report writing system, the target address is, we know, 4748 France Lane. Later discovered the correct street is France Court, not France Lane. So they did document that if that comes up in court, because we know how vile James Owens can be, we now know that it was documented in the report that the address was corrected. All right, the recorded 911 call is here. We've heard that. I'm not going to read that. The interview with Brian Boone. On February the 24th of 2020, 1525 hours, Detective Scott Lowen and I conducted an audio recorded interview with Brian Boone located in my unmarked agency vehicle outside of 4748 France Court, Apartment 3, Orlando, Florida. The following is a synopsis of Brian Boone's sworn recorded statement. Brian has known Sarah Boone since he was approximately 23 years old. He and Sarah legally divorced approximately a year and a half ago, but had been separated prior to that. Brian and Sarah share one child in common. Brian stated there is a custody agreement and they are supposed to rotate each week for Monday through Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursdays and every other weekend. Brian stated their son does not like to stay at his mother's residence. And even though they have custody agreement, he is mainly with him, Brian. The last time their son stayed with Sarah was on Tuesday, February the 18th at 2020. Brian stated Sarah was very unreliable with the custody agreement and picking up their son from school on the days that she was supposed to. Brian said he would have to repeatedly call Sarah to see if she was going to pick her son up when it was her responsibility to pick him up. On February 24th of 2020, Brian began to call Sarah repeatedly starting at 1125 hours, again at 1221 hours and 1249 hours. Sarah answered the last phone call at 1239 hours, which is the typo. It should be 1249 hours. 
and they spoke for 32 seconds and again at 12.54 hours for 19 seconds. Brian said the first call she accepted at 12.49 hours was Sarah telling him that George was dead and she begged him to come over. Brian hesitantly agreed to go over to Sarah's residence since he resided nearby. Sarah called Brian back at 12.54 hours asking if he was on his way. Brian confirmed that he was leaving his residence. When Brian arrived, he walked into the foyer area and saw George lying unresponsive on the living room floor. I think it's important now that if you have never seen this before, that I show you this that I have up on my channel. Uh, I've shown this before on the channel, but I'm going to show it here again. This is the route from Sarah's apartment to Brian's house. I wish I could go deeper on it. I don't think I can. They were literally down the street from one another at 0.7 miles. Remember at one point Sarah walked down there? So if anybody was wondering, well, how the heck did he get there so fast? It's because they were so flipping close. I mean, literally, he pulls out of his neighborhood and goes down the main drive, which this is like a four-way, and boom, there at the apartment complex. Three minutes in the car, it says. Okay, now let's go back. So Brian did not feel comfortable staying inside the residence, so he stepped outside and waited for law enforcement to arrive on scene. Brian said Sarah was an alcoholic, that she did not know how to only have one drink. She would continue to drink and would become aggressive. Brian said Sarah would initiate fights with him when they were together and, and she was under the influence of alcohol. Sarah would punch him and scratch him. Brian also described George to be an alcoholic too. Brian said, at the same time though, I want to rem remind you guys, he also said he didn't know much about George. He knew him a little bit, but not really know him, know him, you know, he didn't want to know him. I believe, and this is, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, that Brian had a thing still for Sarah. Bless his heart. Don't know why. But I think he was still a little sore about her moving on so quickly. I guess that's a nice way to put it, you know, because even if he was fine with everything being over with her, it would kind of piss me off if I was married to somebody and then right away they started seeing someone automatically and they were together for like three and a half years. And especially if this person was not good for Sarah. And I'm not saying Sarah was good for George. Neither one of them were good for each other. That's why they say alcoholics should not be together. Brian said Sarah would initiate fights with him when they were together and she was under the influence of alcohol. Sarah would punch him and scratch him. Brian also described George to be an alcoholic too. Brian said Sarah would often have bruises on her and that Sarah had called law enforcement on George multiple times. Brian said he felt Sarah was the main aggressor. But George could not control his anger and would strike Sarah back. You know, that kind of makes sense because, you know, if Brian wasn't a big drinker and Sarah did all the things that she does to him, did to George, to Brian, and Brian could walk away and just be like, fuck, I'm, I'm out. I'm not dealing with you. But George being drunk and of a different personality, obviously, couldn't handle it. And so he, if he didn't strike back, I would say he probably had to be aggressive with pushing her away. Come on, if you're in that position and somebody's up in your face and acting all crazy and all that, I mean, what would you do? I, I cannot blame George for the what he did. It just sucks that he kept getting the finger pointed at him, that he was the main aggressor of the whole thing when we know that she was. Anybody that reads any of this and can see her personality can see that she was the one that started all this crap. So he goes on to say that he felt Sarah was the main aggressor, but George could not control his anger and would strike Sarah back. Brian recalled the last physical altercation he knew about was when George was last arrested before the holidays in 2019. That was September 4th of 2019. And we have body cam footage of that as well. Brian said Sarah called him often when she was intoxicated and approximately one week ago called him stating that she had to escape her residence and asked Brian to come get her. Brian declined to get Sarah and she never brought up the phone call afterwards. I find this interesting because he knew that she was just full of crap. You know, he's like, you're not in any danger. I know you're not in any danger. That right there, you guys, that is so, oh, oh, let's do some highlighting. I love my little highlighter here. I love this statement because that statement right there is going to be so key for the prosecution. Okay. So if I'm the prosecutor, this is what I would say to Brian. So at one point in time, approximately a week before George's death, you declined to come get Sarah when she called you asking that saying that she was in danger or needed to escape her residence. 
you, why did you decline to come get her? And of course, Brian's going to say, because she does this all the time and it's not a big deal and he's not going to hurt her. I never felt like Sarah was under any harm or I would have come to get her. She's my son's mother and I will come get her if she was in harm, you know, or if he doesn't say that, the prosecutor said, because she's your son's mother you would want, you don't want anything bad to happen to her for your son's sake. Right. And he would say, yeah, Brian said he did not have a relationship with George and they would not speak to one another. Brian said he dealt with Sarah for the sake of their child. Brian said Sarah has been an alcoholic since her son was born. I just think that's so amazing. We need to do some research on this, you guys. I got to make a note. I wish I'd started working on this trial a lot sooner than I started working on it because I feel like there's so much to do. Now, here's the interview with Sarah on the 24th in the unmarked vehicle outside her residence. The following is a synopsis of Sarah Boone's sworn recorded statement. I read verbatim to Sarah her constitutional Miranda warnings. Sarah agreed she understood what I had read to her. On February 23rd of 2020, at approximately 1,600 hours, Sarah was located at her residence along with her boyfriend, George Torres Jr., who also resided at the apartment. Only Sarah and George were located at the residence. Sarah's son would sometimes be at her residence when it was her days per the custody agreement she has with her ex-husband. Sarah said her and George were painting pictures and, a, and completing a puzzle while sharing a bottle of Woodbridge Chardonnay wine. As the evening went on, Sarah said her and George decided to play a game called hide and seek. Sarah hid upstairs in her shower first and said George never came to look for her. After a while, she decided to go downstairs where she found George. Sarah and George both thought it would be funny if she zipped George in the blue suitcase that was located downstairs in the living room area that had a few miscellaneous items they had both planned to donate. George willingly got into the suitcase and Sarah zipped the suitcase up, but two of George's fingers were able to stick out of the suitcase. Sarah and George were both laughing that she zipped him into the suitcase. Sarah explained the attached handle that made it easier to zip the suitcase was broken, but a paper clip was in the zipper and she was able to zip the suitcase up. On February 24th of 2020 at approximately 12 a.m., Sarah decided she was going to go upstairs while George was still located in the suitcase, thinking he could get out of it himself. Sarah laid down on her bed and fell asleep at approximately 1220 to 1230, approximately 20 to 30 minutes after going upstairs. Sarah assumed George was going to get out of the suitcase and come to bed as well. Sarah said neither her nor George were drunk from their wine consumption. Sarah woke up in the morning and heard her cell phone ringing multiple times, but ignored the calls. She said her cell phone was left downstairs from the night prior. She knew her ex-husband, Brian Boone, was calling because he was the only person who called her repeatedly to see if she was going to be getting up their son from school. Sarah said she stayed upstairs for a while and assumed George was downstairs on the laptop looking for employment. Sarah said she went downstairs at approximately 1100 hours and realized she could not find George anywhere in the apartment. Sarah freaked out and remember the last time she saw George was when she zipped him up in a suitcase. Sarah unzipped the suitcase and found George unresponsive. Sarah then called Brian back, told him George was dead, and begged him to come to her residence. You know what's really interesting right here in this testimony? This is in the car, right? She does not mention CPR. At least not yet. But if she's going through these different things of what she did, she doesn't say, well, then I gave him CPR while I was waiting for Brian to come over. She never said that. She never said that. But she told them later on that she had already started giving him CPR before she called 911. Sarah called Ryan back, told him George was dead and begged him to come to her residence. Brian only resides a few minutes away. When Brian got to the residence, he walked into the apartment and saw George unresponsive on the floor. I'm assuming this right here is probably going to say that he had blood coming from his mouth and nose. Brian then immediately walked outside and stayed there until law enforcement I don't know. Arrived on scene? I don't know. It's redacted. Sarah said her and George would drink daily and have a couple of glasses of wine. Sarah said there was a bottle of the same wine filled approximately halfway that was left over from a different night. Sarah said her and George drank the, the rest of that bottle and a full second bottle of wine. Sarah had no knowledge of George's health, but was concerned because he was beginning to lose his teeth and complained of his chest hurting. Sarah believed he was stressed from being without employment the past couple of weeks. Sarah said that they had an argument last week over him being stressed. Sarah said her and George normally went to bed at the same time. George would sometimes stay downstairs for an extra 30 to 45 minutes. 
Okay, that, that just doesn't make sense. Sarah said her and George normally went to bed at the same time. George would stay sometimes stay downstairs for an extra 30 to 45 minutes, but they slept upstairs in their bedroom every night together. Sarah said George normally woke up first, and he would normally get up at approximately 6.30 in the morning. On February 24th of 2020, Sarah gave verbal and written consent by signing a waiver and affidavit form for the Orange County Sheriff's Office to search her iPhone. Again, this is when she was on scene. So we're going to kind of pick up from where they talked about the videos that they found on the phone. And it says, due to the nature of the videos, we believe the investigation changed to a criminal investigation. Therefore, all searching of Sarah's phone seized. I authorized a digital device search e-warrant to search the entirety of Sarah's iPhone XS and a Samsung cell phone that was found in the suitcase at the residence and the, the Lenovo laptop, which was found in the living room. On February 25th of 2020 at 1509 hours, the digital device search e-warrant was signed by Judge John Kest. A copy of the signed warrant was given to digital forensic investigator Udana. Uadan. Uadan. I'm going to get that name right before it's all over. And now we're going to do, talk about the follow-up interview with Sarah Boone on the following day at approximately 1,500 hours. We kind of went over this a little bit. This is where she drove to the sheriff's office for the interview. The following is a synopsis. I read verbatim to Sarah her constitutional Miranda rights. Sarah agreed. She understood that I, what I had just read to her. After informing Sarah about the injuries to George's body, she continued to deny any physical altercation occurred between the two of them. Sarah said the scratch marks on George's back came from rough sexual intercourse, and she did not know where the other injuries came from. Sarah claimed she would drink the occasional glass of wine or on the weekends, yet George would drink constantly. Victim shaming. Sarah said she can maintain herself, unlike George. For example, Sarah, she can maintain herself. She never sleeps on the neighbor's back patio on the concrete. Passed out. Never. <laughs> Y'all, I'm laughing my butt off that she, that she wrote this out like this. For example, Sarah can do 50 things at once and still know the 50 things more previously prior that she needs to get done. <laughs> Sarah said there would be multiple times when she did not want to drink, yet George would. Sarah said George drank excessively because he lost his job and his ex-wife continuously asked him to send him money. You remember as when things started like pointing towards Sarah being at fault for any of this, she starts to point the finger at the victim. That doesn't work, so now she's going to point it at his ex-wife. When I informed Sarah, she told me on Monday that she was not drunk on Sunday. Sarah replied, I don't get, I can't get drunk. Number one, I don't want to get drunk. I don't like being non compliment having my wits about me. I don't like feeling out of control. Sarah said on Sunday, February 23rd, that George went to Publix and bought the bottle of wine. Sarah did not go with him to Publix on Sunday, it says. And again, remember, you guys, there's two trips to Publix. So why she left out one of these trips, I have no idea. I asked Sarah how many glasses of wine she and George had on Sunday. Sarah denied being drunk on Sunday. Sarah denied talking about their relationship in a negative way on Sunday. On Sunday, Sarah believed that they went inside from their back porch around 1830 hours. Sarah and George worked on the puzzle and then painted. She believed that they were still painting at approximately 20 hundred hours. I confirmed with Sarah that she and George had played hide and seek three times in the past. I asked Sarah if any of those past three times did she zip him up in a suitcase. She replied shockingly and sternly, no. As a fact, she said, I would never do that. Sarah explained the suitcase which was originally in their closet, which is located upstairs. I asked Sarah if she recalled taking any photographs or videos on her cell phone on Sunday, and she replied, no. I think I took a picture of the dog. I imagine when Sarah said that statement right there, you guys, I think that's when it hit her. Oh, shit. I did. I bet I did record something. <laughs> Sarah confirmed only she had access to her cell phone by face recognition or the password. George did not have facial recognition or know the password to Sarah's cell phone, but allowed him to use it. So I guess they were just trying to say that wasn't George that was videotaping himself in the suitcase. 
I guess they have to kind of go there. Sarah was shown that the approximate two minute video that she recorded her cell phone, not even halfway through, Sarah no longer wanted to watch the video. Sarah said her plan was not to go upstairs and go to sleep. I informed Sarah she did intentionally go upstairs and fell asleep while leaving George trapped in a suitcase while he was telling her he could not breathe and pushing up on the suitcase in an attempt to get out. I informed Sarah based off the videos where his head would be in the suitcase. We could see that side of the suitcase in the video and at no point did I see his fingers. Sarah said she did not think George was panicking and that he was the boy crying wolf. Sarah was asked why she did not let George out when he asked her to let him out. And she replied, well, number one, I had no idea it was going to end like this. Number two, I'll give you, okay, I'll give you five minutes or so in there. That is so cute, you guys. That is so damning. I explained based off the two videos, George was in the suitcase for a minimum of 11 minutes. Sarah said she did not remember making the videos because she had been drinking. Sarah blamed everything on the wine. Sarah said alcohol is a shitty thing. Sarah said she did not know what to do. I wonder why they blacked that out right there. Sarah said the video looked bad. She denied intentionally leaving George in the suitcase. She was asked why she intentionally went upstairs and waited for him to come down upstairs and did not check on him or let him out prior to going upstairs. She replied, I don't know. I told Sarah that George was dead as a result of her actions, and Sarah replied, I understand that. Sarah was asked twice throughout the interview if the Orange County Sheriff's Office forensic unit could swab underneath her fingernails, and both times Sarah agreed to it. Sarah was informed she could refuse to allow the forensic investigator to swab underneath her fingernails. Forensic investigator Melissa Ruffgarden responded and collected the fingernail swabs from Sarah on video and audio recording. Sarah was informed she was not free to leave, and she was under arrest. Deputy Sheriff Lisa DeLeon responded to Central Operations to transport Sarah Boone to the Orange County Jail. Then we get into the interview with Abraham Marino. Marano, I think, he's, I think he pronounces it Marano. Marana. On February 26th of 2020, two days after George was found, at 11.45 hours, Detective Scott Lowen and I conducted an audio recorded interview with Abraham located at 4704 Lucier Court, Winter Park, Florida, Tillwood Park Apartments. The following is a synopsis of Abraham's sworn recorded statement. Abraham is the maintenance worker for the Tillwood Park Apartments. Abraham had known George Torres Jr. from when he was a teenager in Philadelphia and reconnected with him after learning he resided at the Tillwood Park Apartments. Abraham last saw George on February 20th of 2020. Abraham said he would run into George while at the Ace Hardware store or around the complex. George confided in Abraham about his abusive relationship with Sarah, and Abraham would see scratches on George, who alleged they came from Sarah. Abraham said that Sarah would get bruises from George because he would try and refrain her from attacking him, and he would move her when she blocked his path. Abraham knew George and Sarah were both alcoholics. He was only interacting with George and Sarah when he saw them while he was working, and he said George confided in him more than Sarah did. On Monday, 2024 of 2020, while Orange County Sheriff's Office deputies and detectives were at Sarah's residence conducting the investigation, Sarah was located outside of her apartment. Again, right after they found him, the police are just coming on scene, and this is what she does. So you got Abraham, Melissa Sexton, the property manager, and Jean Harris, the assistant property manager. They approached Sarah, but they didn't ask her any questions related to the incident, and Sarah blurts out that over the weekend, George drug her down the stairs by her hair. Then they met with Melissa on the 26th at the apartment complex. Both Scott Lowen and Detective Coppolot did an audio recorded interview with her. And as we heard in this past hearing, apparently they can't find her. They don't know where she is. The following, so we don't know if she's going to testify or not. But I have a good, good feeling the prosecution is going to know how to find this woman, and she is going to testify. Melissa is the property manager for Tillwood Park Apartments. Melissa stated that Sarah Boone and George Torres Jr. moved into the complex in February of 2018, and both parties were on the lease. Melissa stated that the complex lost, which I think that's incorrect. I think it was 2017. She stated that the complex lost two separate tenants that neighbored Sarah and George due to their physically and verbally aggressive relationship. That's key. 
Melissa said from the time Sarah and George moved in, there had been approximately 20 to 30 verbal complaints in regards to Sarah and George regarding playing music too loud, repeatedly loud banging on the front door. That makes sense. And arguing and fighting. I bet she locked him out constantly. On May 22nd of 2019, Melissa said she had to sit both Sarah and George down and explain to them that if she received one more complaint about them, that they would be evicted from the property. Melissa said Sarah confided in her about Sarah and George's relationship. Sarah and George were both alcoholics. Melissa described that she would see both of them drunk as early as 9 a.m., Sarah talked to her about their physically abusive relationship, and Melissa would see bruises on Sarah. Melissa did not interact with George as much as she did Sarah. Now we have uh, his brother's testimony, Juan Torres. So the night that he died, we think he died that night. We don't know. I mean, actually, I think he died in the morning hours. So it's kind of like you could call it the same night if you wanted to. In technical terms, it's not the same night, but... He spoke, to his, his, he spoke to George on February the 23rd. He received a phone call from him. Oh, and Juan put George on speakerphone so he could talk with his nieces and nephews. The phone call lasted approximately four minutes. Juan said towards the end of the phone call, Sarah began yelling at George that she needed her cell phone to call her brother. Sarah yelled, tell him what you've been doing to me, that you choked me, Juan said. Sarah was very hostile towards George while George stayed calm. George told Juan he was going to let him go, and they got off the phone. We, now, you guys know. You guys know Juan's going to be called to testify. If they don't call him, I'm going to be mad. Juan said that George and Sarah were alcoholics. Third person now that said they're alcoholics. Juan said he knew when George was inebriated because he would get emotional and would slur his words. Juan said George sounded normal when he, they spoke, and he was joking around with his nieces and nephews. George said that Sarah sounded crazy, but that nothing new based off the behavior that they had seen from her in the past. Juan knew George and Sarah's relationship was not a good, healthy relationship, and they were both physically abusive to one another. Juan would notice scratches and bruises on George. Also, he had seen him with a black eye in the past. Juan said when he saw Sarah, she would have bruises on her arms, and he also saw her with a black eye before. Now, this portion right here that's redacted, that's from Devin Jamro. This is the 34-year-old uh, who works at Publix. We don't know what type of job he holds at Publix. We wondered why this was redacted the way it was. And Sam brought up a great point and said that he's probably, um, he's, he, you know, Publix hires a lot of handicapped people. And he might be in that class of handicapped class where they, they're not allowed to distribute information about him. That would make complete sense for his own safety. So then they get to the, the portion with Brandon, who is, again, Vinny's apartment mate. On February the 20th of 2020, at 1748 hours, I conducted an audio recorded interview with Brandon Motes. Located at its, outside his home at that point. He probably doesn't live there anymore. In fact, we know he doesn't because what's his name says he can't find him. The following is a synopsis of Brandon Moat's sworn recorded statement. Brandon had been residing at the Tillwood Park apartment since January of 2009. And on February the 23rd of 2020, Brandon returned to his apartment at around 2100 hours. On February the 23rd, 2020, between 2230 and 2300 hours, Brandon heard a loud crashing sound that made the wall shake. Brandon heard the loud crashing noise through his bedroom wall and believed that it came from upstairs and heard the crashing go downstairs. Brandon said it was normal to hear yelling and things bouncing off walls from their apartment, but he had never heard the noise he heard Sunday evening before. Brandon had recalled approximately two past incidents involving Sarah. One occurred back in the summer of 2019 when he woke up and witnessed Sarah sleeping on his cement patio. The second incident occurred one evening after he had gotten home from school. Sarah approached him and seemed tired and paranoid and was rambling on. Brandon said he was not really paying attention to what Sarah was saying, and he believed Sarah was avoiding going into her apartment. He said he tried to avoid her altogether. Um, Brandon said he tried to avoid Sarah. Brandon believed that Sarah and George were in an abusive relationship based off of what he heard through his walls. Now, Vinny, Vinny next door, Brandon's roommate says that 
I joined the interview towards the end of this. So this is still Chelsea's thing. The following is a synopsis of Vinny's sworn recorded statement. He had been residing in a single story apartment for over a year. His bedroom is located next to Sarah and George's patio and downstairs living room. He would hear verbal and physical altercations between Sarah and George. He was told this occurred so often that all the neighbors stopped calling to complain because it was a weekly occurrence between the two of them. Vinny said approximately three to four months ago, Sarah came over to his patio one evening when he was smoking a cigarette and told him that she knew he could hear her and George and to stay quiet about what he heard. Vincent said he had hung out at their residence before since he was a musician. Sarah asked him one time to tune her son's guitar. Vinny said George was an artist and would show him his paintings and work. Vincent was asked if he knew about Sarah and George's drinking habits. He said that he recalled a time he left for school at approximately 9 a.m. and saw the two of them intoxicated stumbling around on the sidewalk. He described them as functioning alcoholics. He never smelt marijuana or witnessed any drugs or at their apartment when he had been there, he said, but he believed that they had only been drinking. He returned back to his apartment on Sunday, February the 23rd, approximately 1,300 hours after his work, and around 1,900 hours, he heard a normal yelling and arguing with each other. Vinny then heard them yelling they hated each other. Vincent said he does not believe the incident that took place was a playing around type of incident. Vincent said it was too loud for it to be a joke. At approximately 22, 30 hours, Vincent heard yelling, and then it was quiet for approximately 15 to 30 minutes. At approximately 23, 15 hours, he heard a loud slamming noise. Vincent explained it sounded like something was bouncing down the stairs between the railing, the wall, and the stairs, like all the way down. Vincent felt the wall shake and had never experienced a noise like that before coming from their apartment. Vincent's roommate, Brandon, whose bedroom is located in the front of the apartment, said he heard it too. Vincent heard nothing after the loud noise, and he stayed up until approximately 1 a.m. on February the 20, 100 hours. Was that 1 a.m.? That's 1 a.m., right? Yeah, 1 a.m. on February the 24th of 2020. All righty. We're on part two of reading the police reports that were received from the Orange County Sheriff's Office on Sarah Boone's case. So let's start here. Sarah Boone's cell phone call log. On February the 23rd of 2020, the majority of the phone calls during the day that were placed and received were to Brian Boone starting at 1152 hours and continuing until 9, 1920 hours. On February the 23rd of 2020, at 1924 hours, a phone call was placed to a person labeled Cookie. That was George's daughter. At 1925 hours, a phone call was placed to Anna Victoria Torres, which is another daughter of Tor George. At 1930 hours, a phone call was placed to Juan Co, which is a, George's brother, Juan Torres, and they spoke for four minutes and six seconds. George called both of his daughters again after 2,000 hours. The last phone call placed on February 23rd of 2020 was to Brian Boone at 2346 hours. That was 1146 p.m. It was done after the suitcase video was taken. On February the 24th of 2020, Sarah's cell phone received four missed calls from Brian Boone starting at 1125 hours until 1222 hours. Sarah received a call from Brian at 1249 hours, which was answered, and it lasted for 32 seconds. Sarah called Brian back at 12.54 hours, and that call lasted 20 seconds. And as we know, hearing from Brian and Sarah, that was him saying, her telling him at 12.49 p.m. the next day, oh my gosh, George has passed, I need you here. And then she calls him back as he's en route saying, I want to make sure you're on your way here. The follow-up interview with Brian Boone. On March 1st of 2020, at 1636 hours, I called Brian Boone in reference to the phone call he received on February 23rd, 2020, at 2346 hours. The following is a synopsis of Brian Boone's audio-recorded sworn recorded statement. Brian recalled Sarah calling him, but he was woken up by the phone call. He said she sounded inebriated. He said he zoned her out during the phone call, trying to get her off the phone because he was sleeping. I asked Brian if he recalled anything Sarah said to him, and Brian re replied that he did not recall. Brian said that Sarah often would call when she was intoxicated, and he would do his best to get her off the phone as quickly as he could. Okay, physical evidence, important facts. 
On February 23rd of 2020, George was having a conversation with his brother, Juan Torres, when Sarah became hostile with him, and ultimately, George hung up the phone call. On February 23rd, 2020, at 2312 hours, Sarah recorded the first video of George locked in a suitcase. So for three hours and 12 minutes, they fought. It, this is important because this is the time period that Sarah was saying that they were having a good day. They were interacting and playing and doing the hide and seek thing and all that. But we're finding that that was incorrect information that she's given. It's very much a lie. I'm not going to read this part because this is basically the thing that happened in the video of the suitcase. So you guys know what happened there. It says the second video Sarah recorded began recording on February the 23rd, 2020 at 2323 hours. So it was approximately 11 minutes later. And the suitcase was now in a different position facing upwards and it was moved over towards the left side of the living room. The video was 22 seconds long. You know, it's odd because I always thought that they had redacted some of that from the public to see, but apparently not. We saw all of it. Sarah said they both thought it would be funny to zip George up in the suitcase. Sarah secured the suitcase by the broken zipper, but believed George could get out of his on his own. Sarah went upstairs and waited for George to come upstairs for approximately 30 minutes before falling asleep. Sarah said she and George were not intoxicated. On February the 23rd of 2020, during Sarah's second interview, she denied having any physical altercations with George on February the 23rd of 2020, yet he received multiple injuries. Sarah blamed the consumption of alcohol, yet during her first interview, she nor George were intoxicated. During Sarah's first interview, she stated she fell asleep after waiting 30 minutes for George to come upstairs, and in her second interview, Sarah used the term passed out while waiting for George to come upstairs. Sarah did not remember video recording George in the suitcase. She blamed the alcohol for what had occurred. She said she would give George five minutes or so in the suitcase, yet the time difference between both videos with George in the suitcase was approximately 11 minutes. Sarah was told that George was dead as a result of her actions, and she replied, I understand that. Evidence that was sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement with pending results at the time of this being written was Sarah's fingernail swabs, swabs from George's body. It says uh, the findings are that this is second degree murder, that the victim, George Torres Jr., is deceased. His death was caused by the criminal act of the defendant, Sarah Boone. There was an unlawful killing of George Torres Jr. by an act eminently dangerous to another and demonstrated a depraved mind without regard for human life. In conclusion, Sarah Boone did commit the crime of second-degree murder. George Torres Jr. is deceased, and his death was caused by Sarah Boone's criminal act. Sarah zipped George in the suitcase to where he could not get out. George begged Sarah repeatedly, telling her he could not breathe, and Sarah left him in the suitcase and went to sleep. Therefore, proves the unlawful killing of George by Sarah's actions that were imminently dangerous and demonstrated a depraved mind without regard for George's life. And that was dated March 5th of 2020 by Detective Coffalot. Affidavit for search warrant. Now, this is interesting because there were some talk of e-warrants being issued, which I think is really cool. Because these days, you know, it's I guess it's not the paper copies <laughs> anymore. They can actually use like uh, digital copies of a war warrant to show someone. I'm just going to read the pieces that stand out to me. The evidence relating to the second degree murder charges is stored within the following digital device, an iPhone XS, which is Sarah's phone, a Samsung cell phone, which was found in the suitcase, which we believe to be George's. We don't know if it was an active phone. That was the key. That was important to me because I felt like Sarah lied about that. Um, the Lenovo laptop that was mentioned in the interrogation, which she said her son uses. I think they all use it. It's a family laptop. So those three items might have more than what we've seen in the public, and we may see some more stuff in court. So that'll be interesting. Then it goes on to define a digital device, which we really don't need to hear that. All these items are currently being kept in certain property in Orange County, Florida. So they're saying they've got it from Sarah's house. That's all that is. Okay. Then they have directions to the house, which we don't need that. 
Chelsea, Detective Coppola, she has a bachelor's degree from the University of Central Florida, majoring in criminal justice. I did not know that. She's investigated numerous misdemeanor or felony crimes involving children and adults. Since 2013, she's attended numerous courses pertaining to criminal law enforcement. We know that she needs to go take one on interrogations, but uh, we'll read on. She's attended many classes, courses, and seminars to include sex crimes investigation, investigation process, interview, and interrogations. Um, <laughs> you might want to go back and retake that course, or maybe you took the wrong course. Homicide investigation and advanced homicide investigations. She says that the as a result of her training and experience, she has probable cause to believe the following. On February 24th of 2020 at 1301 hours, Orange County deputies responded to 4748 France Lane, number three, Winter Park, Florida, in reference to a female reporting that her boyfriend, George Torres Jr., was deceased. There's something that's redacted here. Sarah Boone reported, playing a game of hide and seek. Sarah and George jokingly thought it would be funny if George got in the suitcase, located in the limit. How, how many times am I going to read this? Same thing over and over again. Let me see if there's something here that's not already in the other piece. She zipped him up the suitcase, mentions that she and George had been consuming alcohol during the night. She went upstairs. She passed out. She later woke up and her cell phone ringing multiple times around 1100 hours. She went downstairs and did not see George anywhere in the apartment. And then she realized he was possibly still inside the suitcase. Sarah unzipped the suitcase and found George unresponsive and not breathing. The Orange County Fire Department did confirm that George was in fact deceased at 1.07 p.m. That, the following day. The decedent was found lying near the front door of the residence near a blue suitcase. A small laceration was evident on the decedent's lip and what appeared to be some bruising around his eye. We're going to get in a little further on here. We're going to get into a little bit more about his injuries. Then they go back into putting more up about the interview. I'm going to read it again. On February 24th of 2020, at 1657 hours, Detective Scott Lowen and I conducted an audio recorded interview with Sarah Boone located in my unmarked agency vehicle outside of her residence located at 4748 France Lane, number three, Winter Park, Florida. The following is a synopsis of Sarah Boone's sworn recorded statement. On February 23rd of 2020, at approximately 1600 hours, Sarah was located at her residence along with her boyfriend, George Torres Jr., who also resides at the apartment. Only Sarah and George were located at the residence. Sarah's son would sometimes be at her residence when it was her days per the custody agreement she has with her ex-husband, but he was not there that day. Sarah said her and George were painting pictures and completing a puzzle while sharing a bottle of Woodbridge Chardonnay wine. Yuck. I don't like Chardonnay. As the evening went on, Sarah said her and George decided to play a game called hide and seek. Sarah hid upstairs in her shower first and said George never came to look for her. After a while, she decided to go downstairs where, where she found George. Sarah both thought it would be funny if she zipped George in the suitcase that was located downstairs in the living room area that had a few miscellaneous items that both of them had planned to donate. George willingly got into the suitcase and Sarah zipped the suitcase up, but two of George's fingers were able to stick out of the suitcase. Sarah and George were both laughing that she zipped him inside the suitcase. Sarah explained the attached handle that made it easier to zip that the suitcase was broken, but a paper that was in the zipper and she was able to zip the suitcase up with that. I'm not reading this word for word, but I feel like we almost all have it memorized in our own heads. Do we not? Sarah woke up in the morning and heard her cell phone ringing multiple times, but ignored the calls. Sarah said her cell phone was left downstairs for the, from the prior night, she, which that was key and something I did not pick up on before reading this report was that her, she had left her cell phone downstairs all night. Sarah said she stayed upstairs for a while and assumed George was downstairs on the laptop looking for employment. Sarah said she went downstairs at approximately 1100 hours, that would be 11 a.m., and realized that she could not find George anywhere in the apartment. Now, I want you guys to take note that I do believe, you know, when Sarah was given out this timetable of when things occurred, she wasn't giving the exact times of when things occurred. And honestly, should we expect her to? Not really. I mean, she does claim that she never looked at the clock before because she doesn't have a job. She doesn't need to. So that you got that. And then you've got something crazy in her life happening, like this traumatic event going on. 
the last thing people are going to do is look at the clock and go, oh, while I'm in this state of craziness, let me check the clock. You know, that just doesn't happen. So, yeah, I think her not having all the exact times tables of when things occurred the day before and the next day, it's not a bad thing. But we know that there were some items that she specifically lied about, i.e. going to Publix twice. I mean, there's just something weird about that. Why did, why was that left out? Was it all about her downplaying her drinking? This is the part where they talk about while they were on the scene, Sarah gave verbal and written consent by a signed waiver and affidavit form for the Orange County Sheriff's Office to search her ex, her iPhone XS. The digital forensic investigator, Juanella Uladon, responded to the scene and began to download the cell phone. While the cell phone was being downloaded, two videos were found on the cell phone. Due to the nature of the videos, we believe the investigation at that point had changed to a criminal investigation. So she believed she had probable cause to search the entire phone, a cell phone that was also found in a suitcase, and the laptop that was there in their home that was in the living room. She was looking for possible evidence related to this investigation. Based upon the foregoing and your affiant's knowledge, training, and experience, and the facts discovered during the investigation, your affiant has probable cause to believe that the information being sought may be evidentiary in nature. Based upon the affiant's training and experience, knows that digital services and digital storage are often used as instruments in criminal acts and are the fruits of a crime as they have the ability to receive, store, process, and send digital information. The aforementioned evidence sought for from the digital device is in the form of digital information, commonly known as computer files. So now they're going to talk about, this isn't stuff you guys want to hear. This is basically just them defining the storage drive and the USB drive. And so your affiant requests the authorization to seize said digital device and through a forensic examination, conduct an effective search of the said device to include, but it not limited to its storage device for the purpose of locating evidentiary data relevant to this investigation. The actual analysis of NEC's digital evidence will be conducted at a later time due to the protracted time a digital device forensic investigation takes. Your affiant or his designee will assign the digital device and the articles needed for the analysts that are seized are properly logged. The exhibits will be physically examined, documented, and later examined for evidence of the aforementioned crimes. The results of the examination will be presented by your affiant or designee and later forwarded to the Office of the State Attorney. The return portion of this warrant will reflect the actual seizure of articles. The examination may exceed 10 days or more based on the high volume of data to be processed and examined, but all results will be submitted as evidence at a later date. So this is the actual search warrant that Judge John Marshall Kest did, in fact, sign here on the 25th of February. So what they did was they stopped looking at the device when they found the evidence that looked like it was a crime. And until he signed this on the 25th, they could not pick the phone back up and look at it any, any further. That's why she wanted to hold on to Sarah's phone. Obviously. Now... Could we question the fact that in the time period, uh, what time did it say what time he signed that document? It does not say. That is interesting. But we do have a waiver. She waived her rights for them to look at the phone. So that's going to hold up. But they did it, but it wasn't signed until the following day. So the question might be from James Owens, because we know he likes to nitpick, is during the time period that they were holding onto her phone and when that judge signed that search warrant, even though there was a waiver in place, could they have held onto her cell phone for that time period? I'm thinking they can, but that's a legal question. Now, this is a statement that I'd brought up prior about Devin Jamro, who states he will testify if needed. I do believe they're going to bring him in. We don't know what he's going to testify to. All we do know is that he worked at Publix or works at Publix. He might still be there. Who knows? Four years later. He saw something. So what did he see? Okay, so you got CSI Melissa Roughgarden. We know that she's going to come in and testify. This is talking about there's that Roughgarden came in and took 234 photos. 
What did they tag? 14, 15, 16, 78. Looks like they tagged about 18 items. I don't know. That's hard to understand how they did that. But they've got these tags right here about the, the evidence. <clears throat> they say that it's a two-story apartment where the crime scene was. At approximately 1449 hours on Monday, February the 24th, CSI Melissa Roughgarden met with Detective Chelsea Copsell at the scene of a homicide investigation located at the above listed address. The following observations were made. I want to see who wrote this. Is this Roughgarden? This portion is going to be truly, truly interesting because this gets into the forensics of the case and what the CSI person found. The Tillwood Park apartment complex was located on the east side of North Palmetto Avenue. The above listed address was a, was a two-story townhome style apartment. The building faced southeast toward the parking lot and the front door had a welcome sign hanging from the top of the door covering the three inch indicating the unit. Oh, covering the number three indicating the unit. This along with some dents were photographed, documented on the front door to the unit. And the reason they're I wanted to say that that's important is because, okay, so I find that important because somebody had made a comment about how some of the neighbors had complained about how the banging on the door all the time over at their house was a nuisance. Um, neighbors had heard them. I don't know if it was him or her, but, but at the same time, apartment doors get dings all the time. So you really can't go by any of that, but the front door led to a very small entry hallway with the entrance to the kitchen inside to the northeast and the living room to the northwest. The northwest wall of the kitchen consisted of a countertop sink with an open area above looking over the living room. The northeast wall constructed a, consisted of a counter and stove with a refrigerator located in the east corner. A trash can was located on the southeast wall of the kitchen. There were two empty wine bottles and three receipts for wine from Publix located in the trash can. There was a kitchen hutch located along the southwest wall of the kitchen. A cell phone was observed on the top of the hutch. We we let we noticed that was Sarah's. Per personnel on scene, the phone belonged to the above listed suspect. The phone was collected by the digital forensic investigator, Juanella Uadon, and her report is below. The northwest end of the entryway, the northwest the northwest end of the entryway led into the living room. The living room consisted of a hat stand in the south corner of the room. There was a pillow with a reddish stain observed on the bench of the, of the hat stand. They did a test for blood for that. I don't even know. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. On scene for the stain observed on the pillow. The results were inconclusive. A teal suitcase was located along the southeast wall of the living room. The victim was located on the floor just northwest of the suitcase. The suitcase was not zipped upon arrival. The suitcase and all the items within the case were documented photographically. There was blood observed on the interior of the suitcase. The contents of the suitcase included a white cap with blood, a necktie with blood, a diazepam syringe prescribed to the victim, a black necktie, a silver Samsung cell phone, a canvas sheet, a pink shirt, an orange shirt, black short, and miscellaneous papers and paperwork. The dimensions of the case were documented at 28 inches in length, 20 inches in width, and 8 and 7 8 inches in depth. The second floor of the apartment was documented photographically and consisted of two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a closet. The victim was located lying on his back on the floor of the living room. His head was to the northeast and his feet to the northwest. The victim's left arm was extended by his side with his hands resting on his left hip. His right arm was bent at the elbow with his hand resting on his abdomen. He was wearing a black t-shirt and camo shorts with a belt. There was a purple discoloration observed on the victim in several areas, including his face, neck, arms, and legs. There were several defects observed on the victim. There was blood observed coming from his nose and mouth. There appeared to be an injury to the upper and bottom lip and one of his teeth appeared to be broken. There were several small cuts observed on the right side of his face and neck. There was a dark bluish discoloration observed around the left eye and the left side of the forehead. There was a red mark located on his right elbow. There was blood visible in the crook of his left elbow and a small area of blood in his, on his left hand and left thigh. 
there were three areas on skin slippage observed, two of the interior of both knees and an area of the upper chest. Investigator Ashley Hammermeister from the D District 9 Medical Examiner's Office arrived on scene at approximately 1827 hours. Prior to transportation, the body was turned and his shirt was lifted. There was bruising observed down his side and several red marks on his shoulder. The ME investigator collected the diazepam syringe that was prescribed to the victim. Now, here's the following evidence that was tagged and collected. The pillow with the stain, which was we found out was inconclusive. And then they had swabs from the pillow. The suitcase itself, the white ball cap, which we believe he was wearing. Uh, a necktie that was probably in the suitcase. A wooden baseball bat, which was on scene somewhere. Two wine bottles from the trash. And three public receipts from the trash. They also did buckle swabs from Sarah Boone. This is the statement from Melissa Roughgard in the CSI. At approximately 1640 hours on Tuesday, February the 25th of 2020, I, CSI, Melissa Roughgarden, met with Detective Chelsea Cop at the Orange County Sheriff's Office interview room number one to collect fingernail swabs from the above listed suspect. The following evidence was collected from the Sarah Boone later packaged, and the swabs were submitted to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for analysis. So she's the one that came in and did the buckle swabs in the interrogation room. Okay, uh, so they swabbed her fingernails on her both of her hands. At approximately 10.50 hours on Wednesday, February the 26th, I, Melissa Roughgarden, responded to the District 9 Medical Examiner's Office. One set of the major prints was obtained from the above listed victim, George Torres, for identification purposes. The prints were submitted to the latent identification unit. My eyes are going in and out. So they took his prints and they submitted them for further, further analysis. The victim's ID was verified by wrist bracelets. The following evidence was collected from the medical examiner's office. It was later packaged and the indicated items were submitted to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Enforcement for analysis. The remaining items were submitted to the Orange County Sheriff's Office Evident Unit for storage. So they got a DNA card on George. They got fingernail clippings from both of his hands and some hair from him. They did right and left hand swabs, right and left foot swabs, clothing shirts, shorts. Okay, so that all went into evidence, all of his clothes that he was wearing. A clear bag containing personal items such as his keys, lighter, and a ring his wedding ring that she was asking about bag from right and left and rights and left foot. Oh, okay. You know how they put bags around the feet when they transport the bodies so that no evidence falls off or anything. That's all that it is. Took me a minute. I was like, what? Huh? Okay. It says all times and measurements are appropriate. All reddish Brown stains observed on scene exhibited the appearance, behavior, and con context consistent with blood and were referred to as blood in the report. All electronic items were collected by the digital forensic investigator. A copy of the search warrant and property forms were left on scene. A copy of the medication log was received from the medical examiner's office. Can't wait to see that. The positive and negative control for the presumptive test for blood was conducted on scene prior to testing the stain. Nothing further was requested of the CSI at this time. This just goes on to describe George was 42 years old. On Monday, February the 24th of 2020, at approximately 1,500 hours, I arrived on scene at the above-listed location and made contact with CSI Melissa Ruffgarden in reference to a homicide investigation. After conferring with CSI Ruffgarden, the following services were provided. She did 3D scans. A series of scans and images were taken using the Faro Focus 3D scanner. The scans were later uploaded to the Faro, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, software, and a 3D diagram was completed. That's going to be really interesting in court to look at. The following items were collected on scene. The item was later packaged and submitted to Orange County Sheriff's Office Evidence Unit for Storage. SD card containing scans from the scene. So that's all she did there. And this is just the written portion of the report. I'm still stumped on how there's two bottles of wine only, but there's three receipts for wine. Three separate receipts for when they bought wine. 
So at some point, something was thrown in the trash. It'll be interesting to find out if they find anything that's... It's Honestly, DNA in this case is going to be weird and hard to prove. Because she lived on scene, he lived on scene. And I think that that's what happens in a lot of these cases where it's a spouse... With both of them living there, it's hard to say, well, her handprints were on this, his handprints were on that. You know what I mean? So I don't know if they're going to find anything, but it would be interesting if they did come up with something that like jumps out that we weren't even expecting. I don't know why I feel like there's going to be a ta-da moment in this case, even though we've already gotten that ta-da moment when, as soon as we saw those videos. But I just do. I feel like there's going to be so much more than what we realize. This is a report references evidence submitted to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement on March the 12th of 2020 by CSI Rough Garden. This report contains conclusions, opinions, and or interpretations made by the author. Interesting. Let's get to this. Bloodstained cards represented as being from George Torres. Buckle swabs represented as being from Sarah Boone. Fingernail clippings represented as being from George Torres. Right hand fingernails, left hand fingernails, right hand fingernail swabs represented as being from Sarah Boone, left hand fingernail swabs represented as being from Sarah Boone. I do believe we're going to find out that she had scratched the crap out of him. I think that's going to be a big deal. Is it going to help if she's crying battered spouse? I think it's going to be important because George has no, George has all these injuries on him and Sarah doesn't have anything. You can go back and, you know, you could disregard everything in the past about them, right? But the facts of the matter are right here and right now for this date and time of the 20, February 24th of 2020, he had a ton of bruises and cuts and scrapes all over him and she didn't have any. Of course, I, well, I mean, that gets into the whole argument of the Marsha Thompson thing because she, she wasn't being beat up the time at the moment. She's unalived her guy either but i can't wait to hear this harper chick and are we going to find her to be credible i've got to go back i really want to go back and listen to what she says about the case and i want to hear because she's on this new case now with um i forgot the name there's a new case that just started yesterday and she's actually going to be speaking on that case so bloodstained card representing as being from George, a buckle swab representing as being from Sarah, right hand fingernail clippings represented as being from George, left hand fingernail clippings represented as being from George, um, right hand fingernail swabs represented as being from Sarah, left hand fingernail swabs represented as being from Sarah. The DNA profiles obtained from item one and two have been entered into CODIS. Okay, let's just break this down. They analyze the DNA, okay? The submitted evidence and DNA extracts are available for retrieval or return at the easiest opportunity. It is recommended that all DNA extractions be stored frozen. That is the end of this one. Okay. Now let's go over to the other document that I received. Okay. This is Officer Kayla Rodriguez, who was the first on scene of the crime. They've listed, obviously, the decedent, George Torres, the suspect, Sarah Boone, and Brian Boone, who was also on scene. She says, I, Deputy Rodriguez, responded to 4748 France Lane on February the 24th of 2020 at approximately 1309 hours in reference to an unresponsive male, George Torres. Upon my arrival, I made contact with Orange County Fire Rescue exiting the home. They advised that the male inside was beyond medical help and pronounced him dead prior to my arrival at 1307 hours. I made contact with Sarah Boone outside the home. Sarah stated that she is the living girlfriend of George. They have been in a relationship for three and a half years and have no children together. Sarah went on to explain that she and George were putting together puzzles on the evening of February the 23rd of 2020. They also drank a bottle of wine. A bottle of wine, noted. At approximately, at approximately 12.30 hours on February the 24th, the two of them decided to play hide and seek. That is incorrect. This doesn't sound right. This is wrong. This would have been the 23rd. I'm going to read what she said, but I think this is incorrect. I think she meant the 23rd. Because this is 1230 a.m. According to what she's writing. The two of them decided to play hide and seek. George got into a suitcase in the living room. Sarah zipped the suitcase from the outside. 
George and Sarah both began to laugh once he was inside. Sarah then went upstairs and fell asleep. In the morning, Sarah realized she'd forgotten to take George out of the suitcase. I asked her when she did CPR, and she yelled, This morning when I found him. I then pointed out that it was currently approximately 1,300 hours. I asked if she was doing CPR all morning. She said, Yes. Sarah immediately changed what she had previously said and stated that she woke up in the morning but never went downstairs. Around noon, she went downstairs, and that's when she realized George was still in the suitcase. She took him out and began CPR. She called her ex-husband, Brian Boone, and Brian arrived and told her to call 911. Quick note, everyone, something that's been brought to my attention that I didn't even think about, but she had to let the dogs out at some point. Those dogs had to go out at some point that morning. They could not hold themselves. There's no way. So, again, I feel like they're gonna the prosecution is gonna bring that up. That up. That how could you not let your dogs out? You didn't let your dogs out. Oh my gosh. Her testimony is gonna be crazy, y'all. I made contact with Brian. Brian said they received a phone call from Sarah at 13:59 hours. Sarah explained to him that what was going on, so he went to the house. Brian walked a few feet into the front door and was able to see George's legs. Brian then told Sarah she needed to call 911. Upon entry into the house, I observed George on his back laying in the downstairs living room. His eyes were partially open. Oof, that's the first person that said that. His body was discolored. I observed a small amount of blood on his lips and around his mouth. His lips appeared to have a small amount of broken skin. His eyes were red. A protective sweep was conducted of the home and no one else was located inside of the residence. Homicide detective HO23 was notified and arrived on scene. Forensic was notified and arrived on scene. Summary narrative. On February the 23rd, 2020 at about 1301, Deputy Sheriff Kayla Rodriguez and I were dispatched to 4748 France Lane Number 3 in reference to a man down. Upon arrival, Fire Rescue 63 on the scene along with Deputy Rodriguez. The victim later identified as George Torres was found unresponsive and was eventually pronounced dead at approximately 1307 hours. I then entered the townhome and observed the discolored body of Mr. George Torres next to a blue luggage. I then assisted Detective Rodriguez with, estab with establishing a crime scene. I roped off the front entrance of the unit with yellowed crime tape. I also maintained a contamination log and activated my camera several times during the course of this investigation. I was then present when DS Kayla Rodriguez conducted her initial investigation. At that time, I heard DS Rodriguez speaking with Sarah Boone. I overheard Sarah say that she and George Torres were playing hide and seek sometime around midnight. During that game, she stated George went into a suitcase and then zipped him up. Sarah said she fell asleep soon after that. When she woke up this afternoon, she realized that George was still in the suitcase. She then unzipped the suitcase and noticed that George was not moving. She pulled him out and began to perform CPR on him. At some point, Orange County Fire Rescue was called and CPR was further instructed over the phone until medics arrived on scene. The scene was later turned over to the homicide detectives for further investigation, and this was the end of my involvement. So that was the other officer that we saw his body cam footage. Synopsis of George Torres Jr. Autopsy. On February the 25th of 2020, George Torres Jr. received an autopsy located at the medical examiner's office. During the autopsy, it was noted that George had injuries. George had long nail scratches to his mid-upper back. A large nail scratch to the back of his neck, contusions to his left shoulder, left skull and forehead contusions, considered blunt force trauma, and a cut near his busted lip. This is Lisa De Leon. This is the one who transported Sarah in the squad car on right after they interviewed her on the 25th, and she says that. She responded to the Orange County Sheriff's Office Central Operations in reference to transporting an individual. This is on February the 25th of 2020 at approximately 1650 hours. I responded to the Orange County Sheriff's Office Central Operations in reference to transporting an individual for our homicide detectives. Upon arrival, I made contact with the defendant, Sarah Boone. 
in other interview room. I placed handcuffs on her and brought her down to my vehicle. I transported Miss Boone to the Orange County Jail without incident. During the drive to the jail, my agency issue body-worn camera was activated. I completed a victim notification card while at the jail, and I will turn take. I took no further action. Oh, please tell me we get to see that, because you guys know during the in the car she's talking, she's running her mouth. Please tell me we're going to get to see that. Then we've got Jillian Barry, Corporal Jillian Barry, on February the twenty sixth of twenty twenty. So two days later, at sixteen fifteen hours. She made contact with Brian Boone at 4311 Mandy Court in reference to a suspicious picture of him and his son, Lucas Boone. The picture shows Lucas Boone inside a large suitcase, partially zipped up with a large smile on his face, both Brian and Lucas. In a sworn audio recorded interview, Brian Boone stated the picture was taken years prior and was before they were going on vacation. Brian Boone said that Lucas was never unable to breathe and did not complain of any injury from climbing into the suitcase. The family joked about how big the suitcase was, so Lucas got inside to be funny, and they zipped it up for him, but he was not locked inside. Brian Boone was unsure of who took the photograph, but believes it was Sarah Boone, as he and Lucas are both in the picture and no one else was there. I also asked Brian Boone if there had ever been any allegations of abuse to Lucas, which he denied. Brian Boone stated that he does not corporally punish Lucas either, and has never noticed any injuries on Lucas beyond those of a normally active nine-year-old. He stated earlier today that Lucas told him that sometimes in the past his mother hit him on the butt with a fly swatter, but he did not sustain any injuries from this and was laughing at the time of the incident. Brian Boone allowed me to speak with Lucas in another room without him present, and in a sworn audio recorded statement, I asked Lucas about the picture. He stated he did not remember the picture, which he would have been four to five years old at the time. He also stated that he hasn't been hurt by anyone and he would tell a police officer or adult if he was. Based on my investigation, it appears the photograph was taken for fun at the request of a child preparing for a family vacation. There was no injuries and the child was not locked inside the suitcase for any extended period of time beyond that of taking a photograph. Okay. Now back to Chelsea Copsell. What has she written here? This is her incident report again. This is in regards to the witnesses. All right, so you've got Kayla Rodriguez, John Martinez. We're both deputies on scene, and we've seen theirs. Then we've got Lisa De Leon, who we saw her in the interrogation room putting cuffs on Sarah. We have not seen her body cam, but there is body cam. Then we know that Melissa Roughgarden was a CSI. She photographed the, the scene, processed the scene, collected and documented potential evidence, and later completed the original crime scene investigative report. Uh, also, crime scene investigator Shanice Robinson and crime scene investigator Supervisor Kelly Wood responded and assisted her. Then we have the medical legal investigator Ashley Hammermeister, who was also responded to the scene to initiate the investigation. She did the, wasn't she, what did we say? She was the 3D scan, I think. She took photos of the scene and supervised the collection of the victim's body by transporting from the scene to the medical examiner's office. Then we have Sarah Zadowix, who is the ME of the 9th District. She conducted the autopsy on George. At the time of the report, she had not determined the victim's cause of death. But as we know changed. The corporal on scene was Corporal Detective Nathan Nathaniel Taylor. He authored an exigent search e-warrant for the residents. Now this is the part that's interesting. Abraham Moreno, who is the maintenance guy at the Tillwood Park Apartments at the time, he was interviewed by Scott Lowen, that's his name, Scott Lowen, and Chelsea Coppolot. That was done on the 26th at 1145 a.m. Two days prior, the day that the cops were on the crime at the crime scene, there is a note here that says, while Orange County Sheriff's Office deputies and detectives were at Sarah's residence conducting the investigation, Sarah was located outside of her apartment. Abraham, Melissa, 
and Jean, all employees of the complex, approached Sarah but did not ask her any questions related to the incident. Sarah blurted out that over the weekend, George drug her downstairs by her hair. The question they have is that while they were interviewing him and the audio that we got from him, this is not in his audio interview. You know, maybe he was talking to them prior to them starting the recording. And he said that about her saying that before they all got there, while they got there. Maybe they spoke to him for a few minutes and they didn't record it. And then later when they go back and take his interview or whatever, like a bunch of idiots, they don't bring it up again and record it in his audio recorded statement. That's what I'm thinking. Again, we've looked at all of these. These are all of the of them just interviewing the witnesses. We just talked about our call log already. We already looked at the important facts. That is all they sent me. That sucks. I feel like there's so much more. Oh, I guess that's all for now. That's all we have from them for now. I uh, don't know why there's not more there. I wish there was maybe because it's still an open investigation. Uh, well, it's a closed investigation, but maybe it's because it's pending trial there is a bunch of stuff that we're not going to be, we're not going to see. This is what I think. This is what I'm thinking. Listen, I know it's been a long video. So if you've stuck with me until the end of this video, I do appreciate you so much for that. And I hope that you actually were able to learn something from it. And as I obtain more information from the different entities involved in this case, I will be putting it out for you guys to have. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please do not forget to like and subscribe on your way out and feel free to leave a comment. Have a blessed day.